everyone, welcome. Welcome to uh, Family Medicine Grand Rounds. And um, also, it's great for you to be showing up here today on a national holiday, our Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, for one of the first times ever, my children are actually off school today uh, to be able to celebrate this. It's a great thing. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, today's uh, Grand Round is sponsored by the um, UVM Integrative Health and specifically part of the Laura Mann Lecture Series for Integrative Medicine. And we're, we have Kara Feldman Hunt to thank for this, that she connects with us in family medicine and brings us excellent speakers and allows us uh, to be a platform for sharing integrative medicine, which has been terrific. Um, Everybody is on um, not muted, so we might want to get that mute going, please. Someone named Kelly. I thought. Now you're muted, Whitney. You're muted, Whitney. Well, how did that happen? Okay. <laughs> I didn't touch it, I swear. Um, what was the last thing you heard? The, just uh, asking someone to mute? Probably. Um, anyway, so today our speaker is Brendan Kelly, who is um, 30 years experienced herbalist and acupuncturist who is in practice here in Burlington at Jade Mountain Wellness, along with his wife and some other um, practitioners in acupuncture and herbal medicine. And he's also the author of a book called The Yin and Yang of Climate Crisis, which examines climate change through the lens of Chinese medicine. Um, he is here today to discuss with us um, some of his thoughts on the intersection between COVID, uh, integrated medicine, and our climate crisis. So thank you. Um, Brendan Kelly for coming to speak with us as part of the Laura Mann Integrative Lecture Series. I'll let you take it away. Thank you. And thanks again to Kara for helping to make this happen. And thank you everyone for showing up uh, relatively early on a Monday morning. So what I wanted to talk about what is what I see as the connect, the direct and immediate connection between what's happening with us with the current pandemic and climate change. And the lens that I want to use to discuss that is Chinese medicine, because as we will discuss, uh, Chinese medicine, I think, is very well suited for this discussion. Because for several thousand years, Chinese medicine has seen the world not only holistically, but actually holographically. And what I mean by holographically is Chinese medicine has understood that the little picture of our lives is intimately connected to the larger picture of the world around us. And I think that that's very relevant because it provides us a context really for looking at potentially the opportunities that are with us now with something as severe as the pandemic as well as something that is as severe as uh, climate change. So a little bit about the context. Uh, Chinese medicine is an old medicine. I know today is Indigenous Peoples Day, which is a very, very relevant and important thing now, in my opinion. And Chinese medicine is a traditional form of medicine. It is a form of medicine that goes back a long ways. Uh, in my reading of the history of Chinese medicine, it goes back 5,000 years or more. And the age of Chinese medicine, I think, is very important because I think part of the remedy for our current pandemic and part of the remedy for what's happening with climate change is the old and the traditional and the indigenous. So I, I think the, the historical length of Chinese medicine is very relevant. Also Chinese medicine comes from an agrarian culture. It comes from a people who have been living close to the land for, for millennia. And it's also fundamentally informed by a connection to nature. So I think this is very relevant, especially with climate change, because I think what climate change is speaking to is how divorced we have become from nature. 
And I think part of the remedy for addressing some of the underlying issues of climate change is for us individually and collectively to reconnect with nature. And so for those of us looking to answer questions about what is a sustainable life, what is a happy life, what is a healthy life, Chinese medicine has been asking those questions and I think answering those questions very insightfully, quite literally for thousands of years. Let's see here. Huh. This is not forwarding. Um, oh, there we go. Okay, so um, Chinese medicine, as I mentioned, also assumes connection, just embedded in the medicine for several thousand years is an understanding of connection. It understands inherently that all of our organs are connected internally. It also assumes that all of the different aspects of our lives, physically, mentally, and emotionally are interconnected. So again, Chinese medicine can provide us with a model or plural models to understand how things are connected. And as I mentioned earlier, Chinese medicine also has understood for thousands of years that we are connected to the people around us and we are connected to the ecology around us. It quite literally is a fundamental philosophical assumption of the medicine. And in addition to being an interconnected medicine, it really is a holographic medicine where it assumes that the little picture of our lives is a reflection, a mirror of the larger issues around us. And we can see this literally from the original texts in Chinese medicine. There is a text called the Nei Jing, also called the Yellow Emperor's Classic of Internal Medicine, that in my reading of the history of Chinese medicine dates back about 4,800 years. And in the first chapter of that book, it says all of the influences in the universe are within us. So that's even beyond nature, right? That's at that point, it's saying it's more than we are connected to nature. We are connected to everything. We are, the, we are connected to the universe. And I think that that's very relevant because again, it provides us a context to, to look at different issues, including what I see as the immediate connection between what's happening with COVID and what's happening with the climate. So a little bit about uh, Chinese medicine. Yin yang is fundamental to Chinese medicine. Yin yang um, is quite literally a prehistoric understanding. It predates written history. It is very, very old understanding. It goes, we've seen uh, archeological evidence that indicates it's over 6,000 year, years old in visual form. So I think that that's very relevant and important. Um, and just a little bit about yin yang, um, the white part of the circle is the yang and the yin part of the circle is the black and it implies movement. It implies that yin becomes yang and yang becomes yin. And looking at the image, when the white part reaches its peak, which is when it's at its width, its, its widest width, the black part begins to appear. So that means when the, yin, when the yang reaches its full expression, the yin begins to appear. And when the yang, excuse me, the yin part, the black part reaches its full expression, the white part, the yang begins to appear. So what this is implying is movement. This is implying that when something reaches its full expression, it becomes something else. Also visually within the white part, there is the black. Within the black part, there is the white. So what that's implying is within the yang, there is the yin, and within the yin, there is the yang. And this is very relevant um, because we're gonna talk about how yin and yang transform both in terms of climate and what I think are the underlying issues with climate, but it's also very relevant in terms of um, the development of COVID. And so in, in talking about COVID, just to clarify, I'm not talking about actually treating COVID because COVID is a Western diagnosis. So I'm gonna be talking about herbs too that we use to treat COVID, but that in some ways is not entirely accurate because COVID is a, spe a specific Western diagnosis and I'm not a Western-based practitioner, I'm a Chinese-based practitioner. And so what I'm gonna be talking about is treating uh, Chinese language from understanding of COVID, things like hot and cold. And so 
This is relevant because with COVID, the cold that is COVID, viral infections from a Chinese medical view are usually cold. That cold can transform into heat, which is how, which is what the image is indicating, the yin yang symbol is indicating how yang, the heat can transform into yin and how the yin, the cold can transform into heat, which is yang. So a little bit more about yin and yang to provide us a context. Yin is water. And as the image also shows, yin is descending. Yin is going down. Uh, yin is cooling and cold. Yin is winter and night. Yin is latency. So late, what I mean by latency is the, 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 um, a person, a culture, uh, an environment can have imbalances. But if there is an, as much, if there is adequate latency, the um, condition can be subclinical, or to use an ecological term, it can be dormant. So yin provides us with latency. And one way to look at COVID and uh, climate change is that we have lost that latency, that the imbalances that we have had for a long, long time um, uh, are coming to fruition. Also, yin is about rest and relaxation. Yin is contraction. Yin is old and yin is less. So let's look at those last four things, rest, contraction, old, and less. Are those things that we value in our culture? Do we value rest? Do we value contraction? Do we value old? Do we value less? And my answer to that question is no, we do not value those things. We assume that being busy is better than resting. We assume that expansion is better than contraction. And in fact, we have built whole cultural institutions based on the belief that growth is better than contraction, including our economic system, which we're gonna talk about. And often we value things not because they're better, not because they're more sustainable, not because they're more effective, but because they're new. So we, we are encouraged culturally to believe that new is better than old. And we're gonna talk about this in terms of COVID because the ideas that I'm going to present are uh, about understanding COVID and the remedies to treat COVID and, and some uh, Chinese herb formulas to treat COVID are old formulas and they're old thinking and they're herbs that have been used for a long time. Also, we're encouraged to inherently believe that more is better than less. And we again, we have cult whole cultural institutions, including our economy based on this belief. So yang, yang is the white part of the circle. Yang is what is going up in the circle. Yang is fire, yang is heat, warmth, yang is summer and day, yang is expression, yang is activity, expansion, new and more. And again, looking at the last four things there, activity, expansion, new and more. We are so strongly encouraged to believe that those things are not only the more important things, but that they're the basis of a good life. And a basis of a good life is a balance of yin and yang. A basis of a healthy life, both individually and collectively, is a balance of yin and yang. So yes, we need activity, but also we need rest. Yes, we need expansion, but anything that expands when it is in a balanced state necessarily needs to contract. And new things are valuable, but something that is new is not inherently better than something that is old. And having more stuff doesn't necessarily make us happier and healthier. There are plenty of people in Vermont. There are plenty of people in the US. There are plenty of people around the planet that do need more things. And I do believe making sure that those people have the things they need to sustain their lives physically, mentally, and emotionally is important. But at some point, having more stuff does not create health and happiness. And again, we have whole cultural institutions that are based on the belief that more is better than less. And we cannot live happy and healthy lives individually and collectively if we assume that more is better than less because we're overvaluing one part of the circle. We're overvaluing yang. So with some basic yin-yang theory, let's move to the idea of yin-yang theory on a global scale. And that's the reality of climate change. So one way to conceptualize, one way to look at climate change from a Chinese medical view is through the lens of yin and yang. 
And the way that I think about climate change now is it's really imbalance. It's really sickness that is manifesting on the large scale of the ecology. And that sickness is really originating, as I see it, <clears throat> within us and within our culture. So rather than thinking about um, climate change as separate from us, I really want us to really consider that climate change is a reflection of us. Climate change is a mirror of what's happening within us, and it's also a mirror of what's happening in our country and in our culture. So part of the reality of climate change is that emissions are increasing and they have been increasing. And despite really clear and overwhelming and conclusive Western scientific evidence that the emissions that we're releasing into the atmosphere are causing serious problems, we continue to do it. So not only do we know that the emissions are causing problems, but the emissions globally continue to increase. And so the way I think about that is that's a sign of our collective imbalance. How can we continue to do this? How can we continue as a people, as individuals, as a culture, as a country, to continue to, continue to release greenhouse gases, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, uh, methane? How can we continue to do this even though we know it is uh, fundamentally affecting life on the planet? And that's not just life on the planet somewhere else, that's life in the planet here today where I am in Vermont, where I assume many of you are also in Vermont. The, the realities of climate change are here today. They are here in Vermont today. So how can we continue to do that? Because we are out of balance. Because the, at the imbalances that we have have reached such an elevated scale that it's affecting the whole planet. So that's the level of imbalance that I see as being reflected in climate change. So in addition to increasing emissions, we have deforestation. So this is important because using yin-yang theory, we can understand that the climate, the planet is warming, the climate is warming. So that's an increase in yang, right? In the yin-yang circle, the increase of yang, the increase in the white part, the ascending warming part of the circle is going up. And with the increase of yang, with the increase in warmth, the ability of the planet to sequester greenhouse gases has gone down. And the sequestration of greenhouse gases has a cooling effect. And the coolant is yin. So what that means is the yang is going up as the coolant, the yin, is going down. So that's a particular dynamic. And that's a particular important dynamic because we can see that same dynamic in our cultural institutions, where we overvalue yang and we undervalue yin. So looking at deforestation, deforestation is not just something that is happening in the Amazon. It's not just something that's happening in Brazil. It's happening right here, right now in the United States. And it's even being proposed to continue to happen in Vermont, the Green Mountain uh, National Forest, which is in Vermont, in Southern Vermont, the Forest Service, who are supposedly the guardians of the forest they're actually proposing a 40 to 50,000 acre clear cut or cut in the Green Mountain National Forest right now. It's being proposed right now. So deforestation is not just something that's happening externally outside the United States. An historical example of that is here in the US, we have deforested, we have cut down over 95% of our original forests as a country since the European settlers arrived, 95%. So if we're concerned about the state of the forest globally, we should really be quite concerned about the, states, the state of the forest here in the US and in Vermont in particular. So to provide some context about deforestation, uh, the latest report that has come out of the UN indicates that between 2015 and 2020, global deforestation um, per year just per year, not, not for those five years total, but per year over five years, is about 10 million hectares. That's 100,000 square kilometers annually that are deforested. To provide some context, that's about the size of two land masses of the nation of England deforested every year for the last five years. 
and to provide a little bit of a longer context since 1990, 80 million hectares, which is 800,000 square kilometers of forest have been lost in those approximately 30 years. That's the size of Sweden and Norway combined. So deforestation is not just an historical issue, it is very much a current issue. And the significance of it is because we know the greenhouse gases are increasing, which means it's having a warming effect on the planet. And as the planet is warming, the planet's ability to sequester greenhouse gases, to pull those greenhouse gases out of the air is decreasing because that's the nature of forests. That's the nature of trees. What they do is they pull greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and into the trees or the plants themselves and then possibly into the ground. So less forests, less trees means less sequestration of greenhouse gases, which means a warming planet because the greenhouse gases are not sequestered. Another significant issue in addition to deforestation is that um, forests globally are dying at very extraordinary rates. Um, I write about this, that when I was living in Montana, um, you could see this happening in real time. This is not just theory. This is not just something that could be happening or could be happening in a different part of the world. This is happening now. This is happening today in the United States. Um, the, the image on the screen is of forests dying off from disease. And when I was in Montana, you could see this going up into the mountains to hike or to, or to uh, ski. You could see whole hillsides, whole vistas that were transitioning from green to brown. And the reason for this is that the mountain pine beetle population is increasing. And that's because the winters are warming. And as the winters warm, there's more pine beetle. And as there's more beetle, they can, they can burrow under the bark of the pine trees more and more trees can die. So this is happening now. This is happening in our country now. And to provide a scale in 10 years, 70,000 square miles, not acres, 70,000 square miles, which is the equivalent of 180,000 square kilometers of forest have died just in Canada and the United States. So it's a staggering number. In 10 years, 70,000 square miles of forest have died in the US and Canada. Um, that's the equivalent in 10 years of the land mass three and a half times the size of England that has died in 10 years. And the result is similar to deforestation. Less trees, less forest means less greenhouse gases are pulled out of the environment and sequestered into the trees or the plants or sequestered into the ground. So the heat is going up as the planet's ability to sequester greenhouse gases is going down. So this is a pattern. Another very significant issue that confronts us is fires. This is an actual picture taken from fires that were happening here in the United States in California earlier this year. And if it looks apocalyptic, it's because it's starting to look apocalyptic. Uh, the, what's happening now is really extraordinary. And the result of fire, fire is obviously warming, right? It's uh, increasing the warmth in the environment. Um, so it's both contributing to climate change and is part of the cause of climate change, right? So it's contributing to climate change because it's warming the planet, but also there are more fires because of climate change, because the, the ground and the uh, trees and the plants are becoming more dry from droughts that are happening in California. As things become more dry, um, there's more potential for fire. So in a, to provide again some context, this is from last year, but last year, just in California alone, 4.2 million acres of forest burned. That's 17,000 square kilometers burned in one state, in one country, in one year, over 4 million acres. And last year, 2020, California had its first gigafire, and a gigafire is a fire that consumes at least 1 million acres, which is 4,000 square kilometers in one fire. Over a million acres in one fire. It's really, um, oh, 
I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, I have something else on, on my screen other than my uh, PowerPoint. Um, oh. hmm. So <laughs> looks like there's a cartoon image that's up. So can anyone else see that? Yeah. Um, I have a con Lise, are you there? Um, yeah, I see it. I see it also. Sorry about uh, that. Yeah, I see it too. Can you forward your or maybe stop sharing and reshare? We did get a warning about a Zoom bomber. Um, okay. I wonder if that's should I, happening. Should I, let's see. Should I just restart or? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, should I re? How can I do that? Um, well, just reshare your screen. Oh, yeah, you just have to reshare your screen and oh, okay. it'll bring all the images back up. Sorry about that. Okay. That's all right. Um, oh, share screen. Okay, there we go. How's that? That looks good. Okay. Yeah, I see it again. Okay, great. Um, so lots of fires in California. And to, to provide a context, um, the burn rate um, in California for the last year in 2020, um, they haven't seen that in over 100 years. So it's really um, significant. So to provide a context for that, um, in uh, 2020 as a country in the United States, over 10 million acres of forest have burned, which is extraordinary. And the results of that is that the planet is warming. Another reality is flooding. Um, this was a picture that was taken in England uh, uh, this year, early this spring, but it could be from lots of different parts of the world. Um, there are similar images from what happened here in Vermont uh, in 2011, 2010, I believe actually, with Tropical Storm Irene. So um, this is part of the reality that we are confronted with. Large parts of the planet are burning, large parts of the planet are flooding. Um, Greenhouse gases emissions continue to increase as we lose the cooling effects of forests from deforestation um, and from disease. So what I want us to talk about is how did we get here and how, how is this affecting us? So looking at climate change through the perspective of people, which I think is very, very important, it's very significant. We, have, we're gonna, we do have, and many of us are going to have globally, less, asset, less access to basic things, healthy food, healthy water, healthy air. There's gonna be more diseases from ticks and mosquitoes and things like epidemics and pandemics have been uh, discussed as an effect from climate change for at least the last 30 years from a Western view. And there is actually an epidemics tradition in Chinese medicine that we're gonna talk about that um, also talks about the larger conditions that create epidemics or pandemics. There's gonna be more danger and more loss from fires, flood and wind, and there's certainly more stress, mental and emotional and physical stress from the realities of climate change. How did we get here? This is a very important question because looking at the issues of climate change from the holistic and even holographic view of Chinese medicine, we can see patterns. And those patterns are really, really important because we can see the patterns of what's happening in the climate and we can see how those patterns are reflected in our culture as well as within us. And part of those patterns, in my opinion, are what makes us susceptible individually and collectively with COVID. So I think what we can do here is really genuinely combined East and West. We talk about integrative medicine or integrative perspectives. I think this is an opportunity to do that. Where, okay, let's try that again. Sorry, Brendan, this is- that, That's um... okay. That's okay. So integrating East and West, really integrating Western science with Chinese medicine. And to provide a little bit of a context for that, Western science looks at branch issues, right? It's looking at symptoms, which is very, very relevant. Things like deforestation rates and flooding and fires and 
rates of disease in trees, in forests, very, very relevant. And what I wanna combine that with is looking at root issues as well. And what I mean by those root issues is where is this coming from? Where are these issues coming from? And so an analogy in Chinese medicine is we have roots and branches. The branches are the symptoms, the more upper issues, and the root issues are where this is coming from. So looking at both root and branch issues can have us um, see things, I believe, in a clearer, more holistic way. So we were talking about the idea of the planet warming as the cooling capacity of the planet is going down. So from a Chinese medical view, that means the heat is increasing and the coolant is going down. That means that the yang is increasing as the yin is going down. So this dynamic of yang excess and yin deficiency um, is very much a part of our culture. And so let's look at these issues economically. Um, is a growing economy a healthy economy? Is continuous growth desirable? And are recession and depression undesirable? How we answer these questions are very relevant, not only in terms of climate change, in terms of what our economy is based on, but also in terms of our own internal condition. Because if we have an imbalance of yin and yang, I'm gonna talk about this specifically and clinically, this makes us susceptible to the inflammatory process that can be part of COVID. So is a growing economy a healthy economy? Not necessarily. From a holistic view, not necessarily. Is continuous growth desirable? Not in a balanced state. Despite what we're encouraged to believe, we cannot have a balanced state of anything if it's growing continuously. And our recession and depression undesirable. And, and I'm not claiming that I think we need a recession or a depression. But a recession is when the economy is not growing and a depression is when the economy is contracting. So just the, our reaction to those words, which for many of us is that we don't want a recession or depression, really speaks to the assumption that we have that we want something to grow continuously. And I'm very aware that when recessions and depressions happen on a country level or a global level, a lot of people are affected and disproportionately people who don't have a lot of money and don't have a lot of economic or political power are disproportionately affected. I very much recognize that. And nothing can grow forever in a balanced state. Yang is expansion and yin is contraction. So we need to recognize that expansion and contraction are natural. Medically. <laughs> Okay, let's try this again. We, we're asking um, the tech team to come on, Brendan, just so you know. Okay, should I hit share screen again? Yeah, just keep going. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. So um, medically, do we believe in new procedures or old procedures? Do you support new research or old research? New or old technology, new or old remedies? And the fact that we're encouraged to believe that something is better simply because it's new speaks to our cultural orientation. It speaks to our orientation of valuing yang over yin, right? And I'm not implying that, that something that is new is bad, but I'm also encouraging us to, to recognize that something that is new is not inherently better than something that is old. Right? And, and this is relevant with COVID because though I don't treat COVID because COVID is a particular Western diagnosis, I do certainly treat and we have treated a Chinese medical understanding of it. So my uh, emphasis actually in Chinese medicine, and this is an emphasis of a, of a lot of Chinese medicine historically, is that the old is given more value than the new. And that's important, right? Because there are new perspectives in Chinese medicine that are only, let's say, five or 600 years old. And for many practitioners, those are not as important. The perspectives that have been around for thousands of years are the ones that are given more value. So these questions medically are not rhetorical, right? They're not rhetorical questions. It's not as if, well, of course, the new is better than the old. 
when we look at these questions from an Eastern medical view, from a Chinese medical view, and if anything, the old is valued over the new. And so what I would say, the balance of those two perspectives is let's evaluate the procedures and the research and the technology and the remedies and really find a middle place where we can value the new and the old. So personally, let's take it to a personal level. Do we value new things or old things in general? Cell phones, laptops, music, cars, technology. And also, is it better to be busy and productive or not? And I'm not anti new things. I'm speaking to you from a relatively new laptop. Um, the uh, electricity for this laptop is being created by our relatively new solar panels on our house. So I'm not anti new things. But again, we're often encouraged to believe that some, simply because something is new, it's better than something that is old. And we cannot maintain balance with that perspective. Basic yin yang theory shows us that yin and yang need to be in balance. Yang is new, yin is old. Yang is warming, yin is cooling. So when we overvalue new, we're overvaluing yang and necessarily we're devaluing yin. And that very same dynamic of yang excess and yin deficiency, the planet warming, as the planet's ability to sequester greenhouse gases going down, that's the same dynamic. So we can see that within us, for many of us, and certainly within our culture and our cultural institutions, we value yang and devalue yin. That's the same thing that's happening with the planet. That's not a coincidence. That's not just happenstance. It's what we're seeing is that the imbalances within us and within our culture are being reflected in the very same dynamic yang excess, yin deficiency, excess heat, and a decrease in coolant globally. So all of these issues, economically, medically, personally, really speak to our orientation. And as I see it, that orientation is part of the root issues that make us susceptible to something like climate change, as well as susceptible to something like uh, pandemics, like COVID. So these are the root issues and I think if we're going to address the branch issues, it's essential that we look at the root issues. So an excess orientation towards yang creates imbalance. And those kinds of imbalances really absolutely can create disease. So these are not tangential issues. These are not secondary issues. It's not like, well, let's look at climate change and then maybe <laughs> let's... Let's try that again. I'm very impressed with your ability to pivot so quickly, Brendan. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Well, you know, the yin and yang is, <laughs> there we go. Um, uh, so these, huh. Okay. Brendan, we are so sorry. That's okay. In our reality of climate change and in our reality of COVID, flexibility is important. Adaptability is important. We live in really interesting times. So just kind of being able to go with the reality of what's presented to us is, is very, very relevant. So um, these issues are really important, right? The issue of... <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, we'll keep trying. The um, our excess um, emphasis on yang creates imbalance, and when balance when imbalance is at a large enough scale and a deep enough scale, it creates disease. So. These underlying issues, these root issues are really, really relevant. Again, they're not tangential, they're not secondary to the underlying issues that can contribute to things like climate change and that can contribute to um, larger imbalances on an ecological scale. So now we're going to get a little more technical in looking at uh, going from the uh, ecological and the social to the medical. 
So uh, the first tradition I want us to talk about in terms of Chinese medicine is called the Shen Han Lun. The Shen Han Lun is a school of cold. The original text of the Shan Han Lun is over 1,800 years old. So this is, a, this is an old tradition. So we can use these old perspectives to address the new realities of COVID. And so again, my assumption, the assumption in Chinese medicine is we don't necessarily need new perspectives or new remedies to address new viral conditions. And this is very relevant because viruses are usually cold by their nature. So when we talk about treating these conditions, we're not using issues like, oh, excuse me, one second here. Okay, I'm back. My plug just came out. Um, so with, with viral conditions, we're not looking to treat the virus per se, we're looking to understand the nature of the virus. So viruses are usually cold. And we know that COVID is cold because some of the early signs and symptoms of COVID include chills, which implies cold, and then alternating chills and fever, which also implies cold. So viral infections are often cold. And the issue with uh, viral infections, including COVID, is the cold can transform into heat. And then once the cold transforms into heat, then that's an inflammatory condition. And with the amount of yang excess and heat that many of us already have, that makes us susceptible to the deeper inflammation from something like COVID. So in treating um, a Chinese medicine understanding of COVID, the Shan Han Lun, the school of cold is very, very relevant. Also very relevant is the school of heat called the Wen Bing. And this is a tradition that was really developed 600 years ago, which is relatively new from a Chinese medical view. And the Wen Bing is the epidemics tradition. So there is a specific tradition that was developed to treat epidemics. So in many ways, that's good news that, that medical practitioners, medical traditions have been looking at epidemics for a long time. And in terms of um, the Wen Bing perspective, the writers that were writing about the Wen Bing from 500 to 700 years ago made some really important points. One of the points is that epidemics are not an individual issue, or they're not exclusively an individual issue. Epidemics are a systemic issue. The way they write about it is that epidemics happen when things are out of balance on a large scale, on a cultural scale. And I would expand that now with, with what's going on with climate change when the imbalances are, are on a large ecological scale as well. So this is important because part of the remedy for COVID is not just treating people who are sick, which is very important, but it's looking at the context that allows epidemics to happen. And the authors in the Wending tradition have been writing for several hundred years that what makes us susceptible to epidemics is systemic imbalance. Also, the Wen Bing emphasizes uh, bacterial infections because bacterial infections are hot. Obviously, COVID is not a bacterial infection. COVID is a viral infection. So that's why the Shan Han Lun, the school of cold from a Chinese medical view is, is very relevant. So the reality that confronts us now is we are hot individually, we're overstimulated individually, we value yang over yin in many cases individually. Our society is hot, our cultural institutions are hot, and the planet is hot. So all of those levels of heat, the personal heat, the societal heat, the global heat, that makes us susceptible to the heat from infections. So this is part of the reality as I see it. So that means part of the remedy for large-scale inflammation is to cool things down, is to cool things down individually and to cool things down on a societal level. So next, I want to briefly get into um, a Chinese medical understanding and, and our clinical experience of treating people with COVID. And just to, again, be clear, uh, these, the herbs that I want to talk about, I have not researched them about treating, for treating COVID. The formulas have not been researched to treat COVID. So I'm not talking about treating COVID, but I am talking about a Chinese medical understanding of COVID, which is cold. This is the Shan Han Lun view again. Viral infections are cold. 
And the reason we can understand that it's cold is because the, the signs and symptoms that COVID begins with indicate cold. And then what happens from a Shun Hunlun view is the cold transforms into inflammation. The cold transforms into heat. So the, the general initial diagnosis of COVID is an acute wind cold. So acute, let's break down that term. Acute means it's just started, it's not chronic. Wind in Chinese medicine is what is an influence that creates change. So any kind of change comes from the influences of wind and the wind blows the cold into the body. So the diagnosis is an acute wind cold. And once we have a diagnosis like this in Chinese medicine, then it is very possible to treat it. So this is tech, a little more technical. I, I'm assuming most of you are not uh, Western or Chinese herbalists. If you are, great. But if you're not, that's okay too, because I wanted to make a couple of general points. One is that in Chinese medicine, ideally you wanna treat the person first and the diagnosis second. So we wanna customize treatments. And two, I wanna uh, make the point that we can use both Western and Chinese herbs to treat these conditions. And that's relevant because in looking at how Chinese medicine can adapt to climate change, I think using more local plants rather than plants from China is a great idea. And I'm very supportive of Chinese herbal medicine, we have a very large pharmacy and we in-house and we uh, use lots and lots of Chinese herbs, but it is also possible to use Western herbs as well. So on the left are Chinese herbs, right is Western herbs. So a formula to use at the second stage of cold called Xiaoyang is called minor blue-green dragon. And in particular, this formula is for alternating chills and fever. And looking at the herbs, I'm just going to briefly go through them. A first herb on the left is mahuang ephedra. It's a bronchial dilator. It opens up the lungs to prevent um, inflammation and phlegm from accumulating in the lungs. Cinnamon twig, warming diaphoretic, creates sweating. Ginger, also warming. Chinese wild ginger, warming. Wuetsa, shisandra berry. This is a sweating perspective from the Shan Han Lun. We're trying to sweat out the cold. The shisandra berry is to hold the fluids in place so we don't dry someone out with the sweating. Uh, bai shao, white peony, is moistening. So with the sweating that we're gonna be encouraging with this formula, we wanna rehydrate the person. And honey fried licorice also does the same thing. And on the right-hand side is the um, Western equivalence to those herbs. Also, Chinese medicine emphasizes customizing formulas. So it's very rare in general, and with COVID, the Chinese medicine understanding of COVID, that we would just pull a bottle off the shelf. We're constantly customizing because the axiom uh, is very important, I think, to treat the person first and the condition second. So other possible customizing um, specifics that we can add to this formula, astragalus root. Astragalus root is very strengthening. To use a Chinese medical term, it's a qi tonic. It's providing energy. So one thing that can happen with short and long-term COVID is that the person can get tired, so they don't have the chi, they don't have the energy to heal or to expectorate the phlegm out of their lungs or to get rid of the viral infection. So astragalus provides that. Another herb would be Attractylodes, is the Chinese herb, or elecampane, which is the Western herb. And that all, both of those herbs also provide energy, but they also help to circulate the energy in the lungs and their expectorants. So they help to clear phlegm out of the lungs. Another herb is colt's foot, which would moisten the lungs. So with the infection and the heat that can go into the lungs with COVID, in addition to clearing things out, we also wanna hydrate the lungs possibly. And also the last herb would be chen pi, simple citrus peel, which also circulates in the lungs and can serve as an expectorant. Next possible stage from viral infections from a cold condition is the third stage, which is called Yang Ming. And this is different than the second stage. The signs and symptoms are different. There can be a fever, sweat, thirst, and pulse. So this is, this is the point where the, the yin transforms into the yang significantly. So we talked about how yin and yang transform. This is where the cold of a viral infection, which is yin, transforms into heat. And so this is basic Chinese medicine theory. This is yin-yang theory. 
So a base formula for this is called White Tiger by Hu Tang. And the base components on the left, again, are Chinese herbs, and the right is Western herbs. Um, the herb that we use as part of this formula would be Shi Hu Dendrobium, which vents heat up and out. So in it just not, we're not just focusing on getting rid of things this way. We also want things to go down. Next herb is Anna Morena, which is with all this fever and sweating that's happened, Anna Morena is cooling and rehydrates the body and increases the yin, to use a Chinese medical term. Also non-glutinous rice, also moistening, and licorice, which is also moistening, and it is also a, a mild qi tonic. It provides some energy. And then some possible, possible additions, uh, Liang Kao for Cynthia and Jin Yin Hua honeysuckle. They're releasing exterior. So again, they're cooling diaphoretics. So in the first stage uh, of this discussion, we were talking about warming diaphoretics to clear the cold out. At this stage, the, the yin has transformed into yang, the cold has transformed into heat. So now we're treating a different set of issues. So we're using cooling diaphoretics. Also using rhubarb root, which is a very strong laxative. So in addition to clearing heat through the skin, we're also clearing heat through the bowels. And again, the herbs we talked about before, attractylodes or elecampane, which are expectorants and moving energy in the lungs and in the chest and giving the person some energy and also citrus peel, potentially to use to circulate chi in the lungs. And I realize that for many of you, this is maybe not relevant clinical information specifically, but I do wanna share the idea of that there are different stages for, of uh, viral infections of cold in Chinese medicine. So we're looking at, as the signs and symptoms change, we're using different treatment strategies. And with those different treatment strategies, then we're trying to customize the treatment to the individual. And when that happens, um, people can really get better. So what's the remedy for all of this, right? What's the remedy for the, what I see as the deeper root issues of COVID or the deeper root issues of climate change? And it, when we have very difficult situations like climate change or COVID, and uh, one perspective can be, well, let's just get through this and then we can address these bigger issues. And I think that that's fine as long as we then try to address the deeper issues, right? So, so if one response is, well, let's get through this and, 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 and then look at things, and then we never get to look at things, I don't think that that is very insightful. So I think what climate change and COVID are presenting us with is really an opportunity to change, is an opportunity to look at our own lives, to look at the health of our country, the health of our culture, and really the health of the planet. And those different scales of the ecological, the social, and the individual are all essentially the same thing, right? From the holographic understanding of Chinese medicine, the little picture is the big picture, and the big picture is the little picture. So the opportunity now is transformation, or another way of saying that is healing, right? So what climate change can really be is a collective opportunity to heal. And COVID can certainly be that, right? Things like COVID and things like climate change don't just show up. It's not as if everything is balanced and harmonious, and then suddenly we have climate change, or that everything is balanced and harmonious, and then we have an epidemic or a pandemic. The underlying root issues for climate change and for COVID have been here for a long time. And what these things are, what COVID is and what climate change is, is a manifestation, a branch manifestation of deeper root issues. So part of the opportunity now is to look at those root issues. And I think with looking at those root issues and addressing those root issues, then climate change and COVID can really be incredibly instructive. And, and, and they can actually be leading us towards health and not necessarily towards more sickness and imbalance. So part of the remedy now is balance. It's to understand the basic things that promote health and happiness and sustainability. And so there is tremendous opportunity in the difficulty that we're now experiencing. It, experiencing. And I think that that issues of balance is not just an individual issue, it's a collective issue. And as by extension, it's also an ecological issue. So if we're concerned about health and well-being and healing on an individual scale, I think it's imperative that we look at the ecological issues, 
And if we're concerned about ecological issues, if we're concerned about what's happening on a climate scale, I think it's imperative that we look at our own lives. One way we can heal the planet is to heal ourselves. One way we can heal ourselves is to help the planet to heal, right? Those things are not mutually exclusive. Those things are interdependent. I do not think it's gonna be possible for us to help the planet to heal if we don't heal ourselves. And how can we only talk about individual healing when the planet is in such disarray? So personal healing, cultural healing, ecological healing, it's all healing and it's all necessary. So part of the remedy that I think that is needed now is we need to reorient towards balance. And with a planet that's warming, as the planet's ability to sequester greenhouse gases has gone down, this requires a rebalancing of yin and yang. So we need to increase yin and we need to decrease yang. And looking at this on an individual scale, increasing yin means really revaluing the quality of our lives and to really decrease the quantity of things that we do not need. So despite our cultural story, having more stuff does not necessarily mean that we will live a happier and a healthier life. It's all about balance. So reorienting towards yin is reorienting towards the quality of our lives, the quality of the lived experience of our lives. And that's good medicine, not only individually, it's good medicine culturally, and by extension, it's good medicine ecologically. Okay, that's all I got. Um, we do have a couple of minutes for questions, if that would be appropriate. If not, we'll just call it a morning. Does anyone want to ask anything or is that appropriate to ask um, in this context? No, okay, well, I appreciate everyone hanging in there through our, um, our eventful um, additions to the PowerPoint. So I hope that wasn't too um, disorienting. I hope I was able to convey that information clearly. Brendan, uh, thank you and thanks for your patience. I don't know what was happening technologically. Um, I did wanna ask, I had a question, like if you were going to just ask one or two questions to a, to a patient, uh, you know, coming, you know, we have our Western lens, what would be something uh, to assess maybe the person's yin yang, hot, cold qualities and what, what would be a couple of simple things that we could take home from this to put into practice even like, like today? How much do you sleep? Okay. Sleep, sleep is yin. And, and I think on a bigger, you know, how busy are you in general, which I'll put subcategory of sleep, but, okay. but then, uh, you know, a bigger question, um, are you comfortable resting? Right. Are you, it, or to to ask, say, like they have, they're, if they're not comfortable resting, it's because their uh, yang is too strong. Yeah. Yang is too, yang is too strong and yin is too weak. Right. And so this is a really significant issue because it's cultural. Right. We have an assumption that yang is better than yin, that doing is better than not doing. So and, and, and presenting that question, it, it's not about judgment or anything like that, but it's just to encourage people to recognize that rest is a balance to activity. And so part of it is just to for us, maybe collectively as just as people to to realize that that resting is part of the antidote to all of this. And so giving people permission or giving people encouragement to rest because some people just are doing things not because it's creating health and happiness and well being, but because there's a cultural expectation to do things. So valuing sleep, so a minimum of sleep, minimum would be eight hours going back to this text in aging. It says eight hours of, of sleep, um, eight hours basically of family time, eight hours of work. And so that would be a minimum, but if we're trying to increase yin, then it could be more than that. So I think a great remedy for those of us concerned about climate change and COVID would be to sleep nine to 10 hours a night. That's very reasonable. Not always easy with our you know, personal and professional responsibilities, but that would be a remedy. And then just encouraging people who have a hard time to rest to rest, 
right? It's because what happens with the lack of yin, when we don't have as much yin, it can be hard to rest. It doesn't feel comfortable to rest because we don't have the yin, we don't have the quiet to drop into a restful state. Well, the way to develop that internal peace, that yin is just to practice. So if people can't sleep for eight hours, you can lie in bed for eight hours, right? And even if it's a little uncomfortable over time, you can just laying down, sleep is great for yin, but just laying down is great for yin also. So just encouraging people to rest. And if, they're, if it's hard to rest, just encourage them to, to, to lay on the couch or to lay in bed. That makes sense to me. I feel like um, in some things I'm studying, one of the things that in lifestyle medicine, they ask you to assess every time you see someone is their sleep and their emotional well-being, their stress level as important vital signs, basically, of, you know, for their general wellness. And, um, you know, it opens up a lot of cans of worms. A lot of people do have really poor quality sleep. Um, yeah. But that's a, that's a good help for just like how to help people see, are you actually in, in any kind of balance? I looked at the chat. I didn't see any other questions. I saw lots of people saying, thank you. Great presentation. Enjoyed it. So um, it's a couple minutes after nine. So if there's anyone else online who wants to ask something, great. But I think I'm ready to sign off. And thank you so much for your, for your um, thoughtful presentation. My pleasure, and I'm happy to continue the conversation however it's relevant. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Kara. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to the tech people. <laughs> thank you, tech people. <laughs> that was Lee's. <laughs> <laughs> Shoo. Thank God for Lee's. We yes. did report the Zoom bomb, though, so um, very strange. I think we'll be using passwords from now on. Wow. Wow. Was yeah. bad. Thank you. Bye, Kara. Bye, everyone. Have a good yin day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.